Let me ask you three questions. One, what does improvement look like for you? Two, what does feeling better look like? And three, do you know what you need when you feel each emotion? Sadness, anger, fear? If you can't answer these clearly, here's the brutal reality. Most treatments won't work. Not because the medication is wrong, not because the therapy is flawed, but because one crucial step is missing. The missing piece is prediction. A clear living vision of what better actually looks like. And without that, the brain simply cannot change. Every week I see patients who've tried multiple antidepressants, switch therapists, join different programs and still feel stuck. But when I ask those three questions, silence fills the room. And that silence is the key because the brain is a predictive organ. It doesn't move without a forecast. It needs to know where it's heading, even if the destination is uncertain. In this video, I'm going to show you why prediction is a missing link in recovery, how these three questions unlock progress, and how answering them reframes the way we use both medications and therapy. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. Over the past decade, I've trained more than 10,000 mental health professionals in psychiatry and neuroscience. And what I'm sharing with you now isn't theory. It's the practical reality of why some patients break through while others remain stuck. So let's start off by understanding why non-response is often misunderstood. One of the most common reasons for non-response isn't that the antidepressant didn't work or the therapy was the wrong fit. Sure, that can happen, but a key missing component is that the treatment had no anchor. Think about driving. You've got the rear view mirror, your past. You've got the side mirrors, your coping strategies, the people around you. You've got your senses, sight, sound, and your instincts. And sometimes you might have someone sitting next to you, the driving instructor or a family member helping you navigate. That's your treating team. But if you don't know where you're going, none of it matters. That's what happens when someone says, I just wanna feel better, doctor. But feeling better is vague. The brain can't work with vague. It needs a prediction, a target, even if that target includes uncertainty. Why is this so important? It's important because the brain is a prediction machine. Every thought, emotion, and action is the brain trying to reduce uncertainty, trying to match reality to expectation, prediction to outcome. That's why treatment can't just be about removing symptoms. The brain doesn't need perfection, it needs predictability. And here's the paradox, even uncertainty can be predictable if it becomes familiar. If a patient says, I don't know what the future looks like, but I want to learn to live with small doses of uncertainty, the brain can use that. That still gives it a structure, and with structure, the system can move. So let's go deeper into the three questions that unlock change. Question one, what does improvement look like? This isn't about perfection. Improvement is about direction. For one person, improvement might mean waking up by 8 a.m. three times a week, being able to cook dinner twice a week, spending 15 minutes reading before bed. These are not trivial. They're functional predictions. We can start small and build on them. Once defined, they give the brain something to measure against. That is reward for the brain, because without that, we're comparing progress to avoid. And later in the video, I'll show you how this reframing makes medication trials far more effective and why it helps avoid endless trial and error. Question two, what does feeling better look like? This is different from improvement. Improvement is movement across time. Feeling better is a snapshot. For one patient, it might be laughing with a child for five minutes. For another, walking into work without dread. For another, it's sleeping through the night without waking in panic. Note here, these are about pictures. These pictures matter because the brain can't update its predictions without them. And here's what's fascinating. Once patients start describing what better looks like, they often realize they've already had glimpses of it. That realization alone shifts the brain from hopelessness 
to possibility. And finally, question three. Do you know what you need? This is the most powerful of them all. Here's what we're exploring. We're entering into the realm of emotions. Emotions are signals of needs, often unmet needs. Sadness isn't just sadness. It's a need for comfort or connection. Anger isn't just anger. It's a need for fairness, respect, or being heard. But most people don't know what they need in each emotional state. And if you can't identify the need, you can't communicate it, which means others can't meet it. And unmet needs drive cycles of avoidance, addiction, and despair. So the shift begins here. Identify the need, communicate the need, and let it be met. Once that's done, you can internalize it. That's how the brain calms. So how does this process of communication, internalization lead to calm? At first, patients rely on others to meet their needs. Just like in childhood, we relied on our caregivers to meet our needs. That's natural because when needs are unmet, we've never learned how to meet them. But once we start saying things like, when I'm sad, I need you to sit with me. Not say anything, but just sit with me. Whilst for someone else, when I'm angry, I need space first, then conversation later. With that, people around know how to meet your needs. Once they're consistently met, predictably met, something remarkable happens. They become internalized. Patients begin to recognize and meet their own needs. They start to think about what they need first before communicating it. And that's when the brain calms. Because for many individuals, these emotions are seen and heard for the first time. Because the two most fundamental needs, validation and safety, are now being met adaptively. Not through alcohol, avoidance or self-destruction, but through language, relationships and self-regulation. This is not just psychology, it's neurobiology. If you're hungry, you say you're hungry and you can ask for what you want to eat. When needs are unmet, the amygdala stays on high alert, flooding the system with arousal. When needs are recognized and met, the prefrontal cortex recalibrates. The predictions updated. I'm safe. I'm understood. My emotions are seen and heard. That's the foundation of recovery. This same principle applies to medication administration. You see, this is where psychiatry often gets misunderstood. We prescribe an antidepressant. Four weeks later, we ask, do you feel better? Or the patient says, I don't feel better. Nothing's changed. The medication doesn't work. The big question, what does that actually mean? Saying my mood is no better tells us very little. Instead, I ask, can you tell me if the medication were to change your mood, what would that look like in your day-to-day -day life? Maybe it's being able to get out of bed before 9 a.m. Maybe it's being able to finish a meal without losing appetite. Maybe it's going a day without bursting into tears. See the difference? One is vague and unmeasurable. The other is a prediction, a visual anchor the brain can work with. Without that map, we're evaluating medication against the void. With a map, every medication trial has context. We can actually track whether the medication is shifting the person closer to their defined vision of change. We can ask, did this antidepressant reduce morning inertia, allowing you to get out of bed earlier? Did it lower your morning rumination, the chit chatter that you mentioned four weeks ago that stopped you from getting out of bed? Did it increase predictability in your daily rhythm such that you have better control over your day-to-day -day activities. With this, the medication now isn't judged in isolation. It's judged against the patient's vision of improvement. And that's how we avoid endless frustrating trial and error. In clinical practice, we often see doctors, clinicians, mental health professionals say, psychiatric practice is just about trial and error. It's not. The missing part is that we've not created predictions and targets to use the trial and error to create new insights. Here's the key reframe. The more predictability we create, the safer the brain feels. And when the brain feels safe, 
it can learn. That's why therapy often starts not with a huge breakthrough, but with structure, consistent sessions, consistent reflections, predictable goals. When an individual's life is unpredictable and uncertain, we create and provide small doses of predictability because the brain likes predictability. It's why routines matter, why family education matters, why pacing activity in the Goldilocks zone, not too much, not too little, matters. Because each of these doses of predictability is a nutrient of neuroadaptation. I often say in teaching, medication facilitates the process of neuroadaptation. It is not the end, but rather the beginning. Here's a concept that often surprises people. Our brains did not evolve to pursue happiness. Our brains evolved with a bias for survival. And that means we prioritize avoiding danger and discomfort more than chasing happiness. But once safety and predictability are in place, those same brain circuits allow us to pursue joy, meaning, and connection. Our brains were designed for movement, both physical and psychological. Cognition gives us the maps, the targets, the plans, the directions. Emotion provides the energy, the push to act. Even the word emotion comes from the Latin emovere, to move. Emotions exist to move us. So the real question in mental health isn't, am I happy? That's too static. The deeper question is, where am I moving towards? Am I moving towards connection, predictability and safety? Or am I moving deeper into avoidance, rumination and fear? Once we reframe emotions as signals for movement, treatment shifts. We're no longer chasing an abstract state called happiness. We're helping the brain find direction. One hour less in bed, one more walk in the week, one argument prevented. Each movement is a signal that the prediction is being updated. And with each update, the brain consolidates safety. Let me take you back to the car analogy. Think again about driving. Review mirror your past, side mirrors your current coping strategies. Senses your in the moment awareness. But none of this matters without the destination. But here's the beauty. The destination doesn't have to be fixed. Even saying I want to reduce uncertainty gives the brain enough to start calculating routes. As psychiatrists, psychologists or therapists, our role isn't just to prescribe or interpret. It's to help patients visualize the road ahead. That means tolerating uncertainty, clarifying needs and shaping predictions the brain can use. Because once the prediction is set, the brain's machinery, from dopamine circuits to prefrontal planning, starts aligning thought, behavior, and emotion with that vision. When patients can articulate predictions, treatment becomes measurable. They can say, this medication gave me energy early in the morning. This therapy reduced my anger outbursts. And that's when recovery accelerates. So if you remember one thing from this video, it's this. The brain needs a prediction before it can change. Without a map, bunch of targets, even the best treatment will stall. With a map, targets, even an uncertain one, the brain begins to move. So don't ask, am I happy? Ask instead, where am I moving? So if you found this video helpful, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel and explore more of my videos on this channel where we connect neuroscience to real clinical practice. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious and keep moving.